As a result of the upcoming anniversary in 2019, people here in Aotearoa and back in Europe are once again thinking through those early encounters and their legacies. Last week when I was in Auckland, um, I attended a workshop at the museum where curators and exhibition planning teams were discussing how best to mark the anniversary and trying to gauge what the interest of a museum-going audience might be for a Cook exhibition. Part of me was wondering what would be the value of this, whose needs would be met. For me, a stark moment of contrast occurred yesterday evening as the sun was setting, um, and I was with a group from Ronga Fukata up at Titirangi where the Cook statue is, and I was listening as the group pointed out specific sites and recounted the details of those first encounters, drawing on an in-depth knowledge of the various journal accounts, as well as from Maori histories of what occurred. The li living legacy of this knowledge was clear for me to see, as was its potential to act as a guide, perhaps, to today and to the future. In museum collections across Europe are held the material legacies of these meetings between Pacific Maori peoples and Cook and his men. These artifacts of encounter might offer one way we can begin to think about the future through the past. Each of the objects tells a complex, complicated story of how they were acquired, traded, bartered, gifted, grabbed, stolen, and of the friendships and the conflicts between people in which these objects found themselves caught up. And these stories go on beyond the time of Cook's voyages as new encounters are struck between European audiences, Māori audiences, and Māori taonga overseas. Between the photographs that we're going to look at tonight, this evening, each encounter tells an old story and a new one. And the coming together of the stories might create a space in which we can move forward. So I just want to share with you some of the um, thinking back in Britain, at least, um, about Cook, uh, such as it is, and the upcoming anniversary. So back in the UK, um, not many of the major museums are planning any events to mark <coughs> the um, 250th anniversary. The National Maritime Museum is creating um, a new gallery, and the Royal Academy has commissioned its first ever exhibition about the Pacific region. This exhibition is provisionally titled Oceania and has been scheduled to open in September 2018 to coincide with the departure of Cook um, from England. It remains to be seen how these new interpretations will grapple with the legacies of the Cook voyages. One of the reasons why many museums are not focused on the anniversary is that Cook's voyages are not taught in our schools and many people are ignorant of the details of that aspect of their history. Museums in Britain have struggled to know how to exhibit these artefacts of encounter that they care for without simply using Cook as the lens through which Pacific cultures can be viewed. I want to use this image to, to think um, for a minute about an exhibition that was held at the British Museum in 1998, an exhibition entitled Māori. As a student, I chose to write my undergraduate dissertation on this exhibition, and I wrote to the curator, um, Dorota Starzeka, to ask if I could come and interview her about her experiences. She agreed, and she also gave me access to all the archival boxes that contained the documentation about how that exhibition had been planned. Inside one of the boxes was a postcard with this image on it by the late Māori artist John Bevan Ford, his work Te Hono Ki Ranana. The work depicts an imagined London landscape. The British Museum um, is the building on the far right, and the Museum of Mankind, which used to be the former home of the British Museum's ethnography collections, which include its Māori collections. And he's transplanted those buildings to sit on the banks of the Thames, anchored in the waters of the river, to see. Alongside a yacht sits the canoe of the great Polynesian navigator Coupe. Floating protectively or perhaps possessively over the scene is a Maori cloak, the threads from the Tarniko border unraveling down and reaching to the land below. It turned out that John Bevan Ford was one of several Maori advisors to that British Museum exhibition in 1998 and also travelled to London to work as an artist in residence for the exhibition's duration. 
and there was a great deal of correspondence between the Maori advisors and the London-based exhibition team in the archives, and it made for a fascinating afternoon's reading for me. One moment um, in particular stood out. Um, in it, the, the British Museum's curator was writing to the Maori advisors here um, regarding what the text would be for the opening introductory panel, so the first panel that a visitor would see um, on coming into the exhibition space. The exhibition was entitled Maori, yet the draft of the very first text panel began with the discussion of Captain Cook. John Bevan Ford wrote an email summarizing his feelings about the framing of the exhibition in this particular way, and he wrote this. Captain Cook was an English and European navigator of great renown, but he is not a Maori of high standing. To highlight him or his collection in an exhibition of Maori works is to subtly change the emphasis away from a Maori event towards a European perspective. My research into the exhibition archive revealed that on this occasion, unfortunately, John Bevan Ford's argument did not prevail and the British Museum opted to proceed with its framing of Māori work and taonga through the lens of Cook. <clears throat> Eight years later, I found myself employed as a curatorial assistant on another British Museum exhibition entitled Power and Taboo, Sacred Objects from the Pacific. Having worked hard on the text in conjunction with the museum's interpretation team and as well um, with various Pacific scholars and advisors, the curator, Lisson Bolton, and myself sent the label texts to the museum's director for his approval. And um, he sent uh, the text back, and it just had a little yellow post-it note on it, and it said, love the text, but why no mention of Cook in the introduction? This time, however, we managed to argue the case, and we actually used John Bevan Ford's words from those um, years earlier to persuade the, the management that you could, in fact, conceive of the Pacific without starting from um, Cook. So my boss on that exhibition, Lisson Bolton, um, she's now the head of the department that um, includes the, the Māori Taonga um, at the British Museum. She's written about this Cook's celebrity status and the recurrent use of Cook as, um, and his fame as a, as a hook, which managers, educators, and publicists, at least in Europe, all reach for when Pacific collections are mentioned. <clears throat> In a 2006 essay that she wrote, which she called Brushed with Fame, Museum Investments in the Cook Voyage Collections, she used the idea of a familiar stranger to somehow try and explain why people always go back to Cook. Discussing, she used as a comparison the way that um, people today think about celebrities and how people can have connections with celebrities even though they've never met them. Um, <clears throat> she argued that European museums often use Cook in the same way. And she wrote, it strikes me that this status, this identification as a familiar stranger, is a crucial aspect of the way in which people in thinking about the Pacific often reach for the idea of Cook. A known figure, he and his travels across the ocean act as a kind of intermediary with the far different societies he encountered there. His presence mediates their strangeness for a Western public. To use Cook in this way is obviously, and I don't need to tell an audience here, um, that problematic for many reasons. Firstly, and most importantly, it reinforces what John Bevan Ford was um, saying in his email to the British Museum, that it shifts the perspective away um, from the objects as, as Māori Tānga, for example, to Cook voyage collections. Um, thinking about them as Cook collections also detracts from the hugely collaborative nature of those voyages. The products of the voyages, the written records, the paintings, the drawings, the collections, were all made by a group of people and not Cook himself alone. Very commonly, however, he is made to stand for the group. And the collections are commonly and lazily, even by myself yesterday, annoyingly, as Cook collections. Um, Thirdly, the repeated representation of the Pacific through the idea and the figure of Cook may actually be at odds with museum-going publics. So at the British Museum a few years ago, 
Um, our interpretation and audiences team tested the public's understanding of a series of words and phrases, and one of the words, phrases that was chosen was Captain Cook. A group of randomly selected visitors were asked what the name Captain Cook meant to them. Only 32% of them knew who Captain Cook was. Of those who did, most were older and associated him with their uh, time at school and with history books. A significant number of visitors thought that they were being asked <laughs> about Star Trek's Captain James Kirk and had no idea who Captain James Cook was. And I just really like the way they're in that similar pose. It's like, yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, many of those who did not know who Cook was were younger visitors and tourists whose first language was not English and who make up a really large percentage of the British Museum's visitors. So um, you start to wonder um, who it is that museum curators um, think that they're um, trying to target when they're repeating this um, idea of Cook as a hook. So finally, on a more practical level, the association of Cook Voyage collections with the British Museum is problematic because there is a startling absence of actual documentary evidence to connect specific artefacts to Cook's voyages. Just to be clear, I'm not saying that there aren't Cook Voyage collections in the British Museum. Of course there are, um, especially given the close nature um, between the museum and Joseph Banks, the naturalist and botanist um, on the first, Cook's first voyage. He was a patron of the, of the British Museum. Um, so there's undoubtedly objects that are in the British Museum that were collected on those voyages. But what I'm trying to say is that definitive histories are few and far between. So repeated internal reorganizations, some dating back hundreds of years, mean that many of the early p collections from this region have become separated from their original historical context. For example, the department where the Māori collections are held, um, they've been um, moved around a number of times over the years um, and are now grouped in a department um, with African and uh, North American collections. So much original documentation has been lost over the years unsubstantiated claims have been made and about particular objects and then that tends to get repeated um, and so mistakes, mistakes are frequently repeated. So for example, if you searched on the British Museum's online database on the web for New Zealand and Captain Cook, you would get 84 results. Some of these are prints and drawings, so just for the sake of this discussion, we'll put them to one side. But if you clicked on some of the artifacts that came up, um, looking to find more information about their particular history and their particular um, collection information, you might discover that things are not quite as straightforward as you had initially thought. So for example, if you selected these three uh, Maori tatua belts um, that come up when you search uh, Cook and New Zealand, you would find that actually there's only circumstantial evidence that they were collected on any of Cook's voyages. Um, another example is this chisel, described as possibly being acquired on one of Cook's voyages. Some association in the past, or perhaps their similarity in appearance to other known Cook voyage pieces, has led them to being classified as Cook voyage. In other words, without getting too you know, bogged down in museum detail, what I'm trying to um, share with you is that there's a lot more research to be done in trying to um, peel back the layers um, of institutional muddle um, to find specific histories. Um, certain pieces can be more definitely associated with Cook's voyages. So for example, this heitiki is on display in the British Museum's Enlightenment Gallery and is labelled Captain Cook's Heitiki. Um, it's probably one presented to Cook at Hawke's Bay in 1769, and upon the return of the endeavour, Cook himself presented it to King George. So today it forms part of what is known as the Royal Loan Collection, which means it doesn't legally belong to the museum, but it's rather on loan from Her Majesty the Queen. <clears throat> Other particularly distinctive objects, such as this unique carved hand from Rapa Nui, are easy to identify from their description in the voyage journals. So in this case, 
um, Georg Forster, who was a naturalist on the second voyage, wrote that this piece had been presented to his father by an islander named Mahine. And on the return to um, England, uh, the Forster presented, made a present of it to the British Museum. <clears throat> Just to share with you another example of a piece that's definitely known to be collected on um, Cook's first voyage, it's this shield which is in the British Museum that's um, recently been on exhibition in Canberra. And the reason that it's known, it's thought to have been taken by a member of Cook's crew along with four spears on the 29th of April 1770 <coughs> from Botany Bay. And this would make um, this shield and the spears the earliest surviving artefacts from Australia to have been collected by Europeans. And in this case, the identification of this shield um, as the one taken on that occasion has been um, made by comparing it with a, um, a drawing that was made shortly after by the, the artist on the, the first voyage. And the hole that you can see just in the centre of the shield matches exactly with one in the drawing. So despite the fact that the British Museum and Captain Cook are somehow connected uh, constantly in people's minds, it's actually another museum, um, the Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology in Cambridge, that holds the largest collection of Cook first voyage artefacts. <clears throat> That's just a photo of the inside the galleries. Um, so the Cambridge Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology is one of eight museums that form part of the University of Cambridge. The museum was founded in 1883, um, and the Pacific has always been um, central to its interests. Indeed, um, oh, that's another view of the gallery. <clears throat> One of the reasons why the museum was founded in the first place um, was because of the donation of a significant collection of Pacific artefacts to the University of Cambridge by Sir Arthur Go Gordon, first governor of Fiji. Gordon wrote to the university trying to persuade them to create a museum and to employ this guy, Anatole von Hugel, a young Austrian traveler, um, to be the first curator. However, uh, objects from the Pacific have a history in Cambridge way before um, the founding of the museum in 1883. Two artefacts believed to be the earliest surviving objects from the Pacific in any museum around the world are held in the collections of Cambridge University's Museum of Earth Sciences. They are an ads blade from New Britain, which was collected in 1700, and this beautiful slingstone from Guam. The stone was collected by William Dampier in May 1686 and made its way to Cambridge through a network of scientists, academics and collectors, all associated with, in some way or another with the famous university. And I just wanted to show you this piece because its, its existence and its survival and its being in Cambridge um, reminds us that the, um, the famous explorers of the late 18th century, such as Cook, were already in engaged in a business that already had a long history. And it's also a reminder that Cambridge um, has a, a history of being this point of connection where objects, and people and relationships um, come together. And indeed, it was this network of people and relationships that brought Cook Voyage material to the Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology. So of over 2,000 objects with a Cook Voyage provenance, which are dispersed among dozens of museums in Europe, North America, the Pacific and elsewhere, Cambridge holds over 200, including the largest single set, some 100 artefacts that date from Cook's first voyage. 44 of those are Māori Taonga. This collection was presented by Cook to his patron, the first Lord of the Admiralty and the fourth Earl of Sandwich. So um, this guy, John Montague, he'd been a student in Cambridge at Trinity College and um, he'd main maintained a close relationship with the city. And it, in October 1771, just three months after the endeavor returned to England, he sent a collection from his country house to Cambridge and um, arriving at Trinity College, Cambridge, it arrived, this collection arrived um, with an annotated delivery note that still exists in the college archives. That's um, just to give you a nice picture of Cambridge um, and the Trinity College. 
whether um, the objects from the first voyage were first sent. That's the library where they were on display for many years. Um, and Thomas Green was the Trinity College librarian who took receipt of these objects that had pretty much come straight from the Endeavour, gone to the, the head of the, the Navy, the Lord of the Admiralty, and then he'd sent them to Cambridge, to Trinity College, his old college. And this is um, the first page of that list that still survives today, that is known now as the Trinity List. Um, and at the top, it describes um, what the collection contained. And it says, uh, 102 weapons, utensils, and manufactures of various kinds collected by Captain Cook on His Majesty's ship, the Endeavour, in the years 1768, 1769, 1770, and 1771 in the newly discovered South Sea Islands and New Zealand, the inhabitants of which were totally unacquainted with the use of metals and had never had intercourse with any European nation. So that's how the collection was framed in the minds of the people who took receipt of it um, in Cambridge. And the, <clears throat> the, the collection consisted mainly of artifacts from Tahiti and New Zealand, but it also included items from Rurutu in the Austral Islands, New South Wales, Java, and South America. And so this list is now, as I say, referred to as the Trinity List, and it's the most important document that survives from a museum perspective um, to um, allow you to study some of the specific uh, objects that were collected on that first voyage. It makes the connection between the objects and the voyage, so unlike the pieces in the British Museum where that documentation has become lost or confused, the pieces in Cambridge can be um, traced back um, thanks to that list. And Thomas Green, the librarian who took receipt of that collection in October 1771, was very librarian-like in his um, approach to dealing with the collection. Um, and what that list reveals is that all the objects that had been collected throughout the voyage had been grouped together um, according to types and then um, amassed into kind of sets. So you'd have, say, two examples of a type of paddle, three examples of a type of cloak, some uh, sample of flax. So they put them into these kind of sets and they sent them out to various institutions um, around Britain. And this sorting process, if you can imagine what that would have been like when the, the Endeavour got back, um, probably happened shortly after the ship had docked. But perhaps the, I think that they'd been thinking and planning about that during the voyage. They um, possibly led by Banks, um, who was the kind of lead scientific member of the voyage. But they'd obviously been thinking carefully about the future of those artefacts, what would happen to them, how they would be thought of by a European audience. So they group them into these types based on their physical properties and they give them um, these kind of type numbers. And this label I'll just use as an example. So it says um, paddle and that's number one as the paddle of a number one type from New Zealand brought to England by Captain Cook. And if we just go back to that. Um, the first item on the list there that you can see says two specimens of number one paddle. So they're talking about their two specimens of the type of paddle that they had defined as number one paddle. So it's kind of confusing, but it shows that they're trying to be systematic in some way, although, you know, that may not make sense to many of us now, but um, they came up with these types. And the librarian, Thomas Green, checked the initial list um, of all the objects he received into Cambridge. And at the end, the last paragraph, he makes some notes of the things that had arrived in Cambridge but weren't on the original list. So in other words, he's trying to slot them into these types. Um, so in order for him to, to, to understand that, it's likely that the, each of the objects was labelled with a label like this that actually had it so type on it, so paddle type number one. It's now known that a similar consignment of objects that 
was sent to Cambridge, um, was sent to the British Museum by the, the Navy. So they probably received a set of objects very similar to those that were sent to Cambridge. Um, and research is going on at the British Museum to try and find labels like this that might allow some pieces to be um, reconnected with, with their histories. Just before I came away, my colleague found um, just such a label inside a basket from Tahiti. So it's been tucked inside. Um, so despite the lot of time having passed, um, obviously since these objects left their homes, there's still new information being found. <clears throat> it seems extremely likely that Cook himself would have overseen the selection of objects and their dispatch to the Earl of Sandwich, um, who then sent them on to Cambridge. Because after the first voyage returned, Cook was anxious um, to try and please his powerful supporter. Sandwich, after all, was the Lord of the Admiralty and Cook's patron, so he would have wanted to make sure that Sandwich received not just a full representative set of the types of objects collected, but perhaps some of the pieces that were considered the finest in terms of quality. Although this is slightly speculative, it was like guesswork on my part, I think it's the, the, the very process that they'd gone through of sorting and creating these typologies shows that they had thought carefully about what the fate of these artefacts might be. <clears throat> Many of the objects in the collection are everyday items, um, such as examples of particular materials, um, this bundle of plaited coconut fibre from Tahiti. Uh, or this sample of flax um, in the process of being prepared for weaving. And there's a, um, a very similar sample of flax, you know, exactly the kind of same size in the British Museum, which is likely to, to be a first voyage item. So um, just to make the point that not every piece is, you know, there's a whole range of material um, that was collected. Other objects um, symbolise the nature of encounters between islanders and the ship's crew, and this is something that I know um, is of interest particularly in this area. So these two paddles, which have been the subject of much research <coughs> in recent years, and have been identified as those two type number one paddles that were the first items on that Trinity list. Uh, they may be the earliest surviving examples of core fi fi painting, and they come from this area, the Gisborne area. Um, my colleague, um, and Maria Salmond, uh, Anne Salmond's daughter, and Anne Salmond herself, and Steve Gibbs, an um, artist from Ngaito Manuhiri, have been doing a lot of work, along with others, um, on these two paddles. And they were almost certainly acquired just south of Poverty Bay and north of Mahia Peninsula during a rigorous day's trading between local Māori and crew members on board the Endeavour on the 12th of October 1769, three days after the fateful encounter of the crew and Māori people's first meeting. Um, the journals um, record that a group of seven canoes, seven waka containing about 50 people, approached the ship as it lay three miles offshore. Sidney Parkinson, the ship's draftsman and artist, described these craft and crew in detail, noting that their paddles were curiously stained with a red colour. <clears throat> Joseph Banks wrote that the people were, this is a quote, the people were reluctant to approach the ship until a further canoe, manned by four people, was seen for coming from Poverty Bay or near it. The crew of this four-man vessel was instrumental in encouraging the others to come on board the endeavour, and a series of exchanges ensued. Um, and this is the drawing that Parkinson made um, after the paddles had been collected. Um, <clears throat> so according to the surgeon, William Monkhouse, the visitors behaved, quote, very orderly and talked with Tupaya, the Tahitian priest navigator who had joined the voyage in Tahiti. And Monkhouse wrote that Tupaya gratified them with the sight of his tattooed hips. Joseph Banks wrote in his journal, they had many presents given to them, notwithstanding which, they quickly sold almost everything they had with them, even the clothes from their backs and the paddles out of their boats. Monkhouse described how those remaining in the canoes, the largest of which were some 40 feet long, 
quote, had in the meantime traded very freely with our people, bartering their clothing, weapons and ornaments for Tahitian cloth. So sometime after this hectic session, um, which is, uh, I know, a, a moment of encounter of great significance in this region and something that we've been talking about with the various groups that we've um, been meeting with, the exact specifics of the places, the sites where these encounters happened. Um, sometime after that, Parkinson found a quiet moment to sit down and attempted to transfer the intricate designs on some of the paddles they had collected onto paper. Neither of the paddles in Cambridge matches exactly with those that are shown in the, in the drawing, although they clearly belong to the same set, not just because of the painted designs, but because of this. Um, there's one probably from the same set that's um, now in the British Museum. And this set of paddles, at the, at the moment, 18 of paddles thought to have been traded on that one occasion have been tracked back into different um, museum collections around Europe. So there's uh, two in Cambridge, one in the British Museum. There's some in um, some museums in the north of England. There's two in Stuttgart in Germany. So they're kind of dispersed. But some of the work that Steve Gibbs and others have been doing is to bring these back together together. Um, and one of the ways they're able to do that is by looking at this distinctive carving on the looms of the paddles, as well as the core fi fi patterns. And um, oh, that's just a picture of, yeah, of Steve Gibbs um, looking at the, the paddles in Stuttgart, along with a crew of um, researchers with him, um, including Anne Salmond and others. Mm, and Amy, yeah. Um, recently it's been argued, and this was talked a lot about yesterday, which was, was interesting, that it's highly likely that many of the Taonga gifted in these encounters would have been presented to Tupaya rather than to members of the crew, such as Cook or Banks. Tupaya would have been recognised as someone of great status by local people <coughs> and was able to act as interpreter in, in engagements with Māori. The prestigious items traded may have been presented to him in an effort to bind him in and his manner into local whakapapa networks with the expectation of future returns. In the event, Tupaya died uh, before the voyage got back to England and it's probable that any items that had been gifted to him would have passed into the possession of Joseph Banks, who was his kind of closest contact on the boat, and brought back to Britain and then from there made their way into the various museum collections. Um, so that's really interesting for, for me and I'm sure for, for others to think about the... Um, it sh it's like another John Bevan Ford moment. It sort of shifts your thinking that people were presenting these things probably to to Pia, someone that they could communicate with, somebody that they could understand and recognise the manner of who they were dealing with. <clears throat> Whilst in the case of these paddles, it's been possible to make connections between specific objects, events and particular peoples, in other cases, the histories of what are without doubt prestigious and important taonga remain as yet unprovenanced. So, for example, um, in Cambridge, on that um, first voyage list, the Trinity list, there it includes seven Maori cloaks, which were acquired by crew members on board the Endeavour between October 1769 and March 1770, most likely somewhere along the East Coast. So six of the cloaks are woven from mucka. Um, this one is a, a dog skin, beautiful dogskin cloak um, with a mucka kopapa and then the strips of dogskin um, laid over it. And it's got um, little dog hair and feather decorations surviving at the side. It's beautiful. Um, <clears throat> and that's an a extremely rare um, matte style cloak a plaited cloak they're sometimes described as. I think there's only about five known in museum collections, two in New Zealand and three in Europe. Um, and so basically it's made as in the same way as I understand it as a fariki, but it has the two ties. You can see distinct, definitely at the top that it, it was worn, it was a garment. And so that's something that for me personally is very interesting. I'd love to try and get 
um, share images and information about these cloaks and see if there's a way that people can um, connect them to specific locations, to specific weaving traditions. Um, that's a close-up of one of the, the um, akaitaka, and it's, it's got this dog hair at the bottom and this uh, quite small tarnico border. That's the, the dog hair and the feather decoration on the, the dog skin cloak. So just, I think it's just one or two little bits of red feather surviving. But you know that, that it's obviously a, a piece of great, great significance. <clears throat> Other examples of some of the objects that were collected on that first voyage, um, possibly from this area that are in Cambridge, but have yet to be connected back to specific communi communities, include this comb. Um, this wooden comb, small comb, it's about that big. Um, very like the one drawn um, by Parkinson um, after the first, uh, during the first voyage. Um, this courtiate is one of five hand weapons in the collection. Um, and this tayaha, which um, is in the collection in Cambridge alongside two po fenua and one um, tefa tefa. Um, and someone was asking about those yesterday as uh, specific weapons that people are interested in, that in the journals it records that, um, you know, a certain weapon was taken from a certain chief. And so there, there may be a way, um, I don't know, that they might be able to look at this piece and, and, make, and make a connection back to a particular um, community or even a particular person. Um, <clears throat> this is a beautiful, long, woven tartua belt. So... Um, as I'm sure you know, usually the, the tartua are plaited with, from strips of harakeke, but this one is, is woven and it's extremely long. It's like 2.8 meters long. So it would have been wrapped around the body, obviously, um, and the, whole, the, the length of the, the belt is stained with, with red ochre, um, indicating that it was probably being worn by someone of great manner um, at the time that it was traded. <clears throat> so the stories I've shared with you um, here represents some of the kind of research that's been taking place back in, in Britain um, surrounding Taonga in European museums. However, it's only one kind of research. Um, museums in Europe have, over the last 10 years, begun to acknowledge the agency of Maori people wanting to have access to and information about the Taonga held overseas. Um, mo almost all research projects now, as a rule, um, include funding that allows people to come to London or come to Britain to try and connect um, collections back to communities. And institutions are getting a bit better at letting people interact with objects in a way that they might not have done previously. So um, recently in Cambridge, a uh, uh, Tahitian a musician visited who wanted to actually play some of the instruments in the collection to just to try and get a sense of how they would have been made and how they would have sounded to help him begin to try and um, recreate those traditions and so the museum was was fine with that and similarly um, this is the Maori weaving historian Patricia um, <coughs> Tara Paul Wallace and um, she came and she had really close, detailed look at the belts in Cambridge, the, the plaited belts. And then outside then we had some, um, you know, materials to hand and we were trying to recreate with her expertise how they might have been made. And she had some really um, fascinating insights. <clears throat> so this kind of research... Um, is really just the beginning of the conversation. Um, further conversations need to happen um, and have been happening about the possibilities of using the 250th anniversary in 2019 as a focus for um, the loan of Taonga back to this area. So there's um, a lot still to, to discuss. Um, so I just wanted to finish by this book, which is just hot, which is published right now, which is the full catalogue of the collect early collections in Cambridge. Um, every, uh, of the, every piece, not just from the first voyage, but from the second and third voyage and from other early missionary collections has been photographed and, and what is known about it is, is in, this, um, in this publication. So, um, but obviously not everyone wants to 
you know, rush out and buy an expensive book. So what we've been doing, thanks to Damien um, and the funding associated with my visit, is to get 20 of these um, Taonga photographed and printed out large, and we've been leaving them with the various iwi that we've been visiting um, as a kind of a koha, just to acknowledge um, that this is a relationship that uh, is in process. And um, yeah, I'm here to, to share my um, understandings with you and happy to talk to you now further with any questions about any issues that you might have. So thank you.